Good evening again. Welcome again. And I'd, I'd like to, uh, to welcome the folks around the world who are joining us uh, through the, uh, the live webcast uh, that we're, we're running today. So we are opening the, uh, the 16th International Wildlife Law Conference with the Edward and Bonnie Foreman Biodiversity Lecture. The lecture series is made possible through the generous support of a great friend of Stetson, Bonnie Foreman. Bonnie could not be with us today, but uh, she is here in spirit. This is really her favorite event, and uh, we so much appreciate all that she does for Stetson. Our foreman lecturer for this evening is Elizabeth Gateri. Elizabeth is a lawyer and advocate of the High Court of Kenya. She has diverse expertise in community land tenure systems, conservancy models, international environmental legislative and policy systems, renewable energy, and wildlife conservation laws. She previously headed the legal support program at the Kenya Land Conservation Trust in Kenya, where she applied economic and legal instruments to secure land for wildlife habitat. She is currently leading Wildlife Direct's efforts to provide legal interventions in Africa in the area of illegal wildlife trade and specifically the conservation of elephants through the Hands Off Our Elephants campaign. Her presentation will cover the impacts of illegal wildlife trade and the challenges of prosecuting transboundary illegal wildlife trade. She will uh, discuss its nexus to core international crimes and emerging prosecution strategies in this area of law. Please welcome Elizabeth Katari. Wow, I have never heard myself introduced like that before. <laughs> Um, esteemed law students and respected colleagues, Jumbo. When, when I say Jumbo, you say Jumbo. It's good evening in Swahili. Jumbo. Jumbo. <laughs> there you go. Um, I would like to thank uh, Professor Gagna for your kind invitation to the 16th Annual International Wildlife Law Conference and also to thank the Dean for hosting this event and also to thank Bonnie Foreman for her generous, generous support in creating what I call, in doing what I call creating a generation of wildlife warriors, because that's exactly what we're doing here. Um, so I would like us um, to start by giving you a little bit of a background of what I currently do. At Wildlife Direct as a legal affairs manager and running the wildlife uh, department, we monitor every wildlife crime case in the country. We look at how crime is being prosecuted, wildlife crime is being prosecuted, and uh, look at uh, the dynamics and the capacities of prosecutors. From that work, we postulate uh, interventions and, and proposals. The first report came out in 2013. It was the first report of its kind in the country because until then, uh, legal work was continu continuing in a vacuum of um, evidence, uh, you know, lack of evidence in driving the interventions. So one of the things we realized from that report was that um, prosecutions were being conducted by people who did not have a background training in law. So in most countries in the world, prosecutors are actually uh, lawyers, but in Kenya, wildlife crime was being prosecuted by the police. So we proposed to the director of public prosecutions that he should gazette a dedicated, specialized team to prosecute wildlife crime, and that, that uh, suggestion was accepted. Further, we suggested to uh, the parliamentary committee in charge of natural resources to change the law. Before uh, 2014, Kenyan law uh, gave the penalty of 400 US dollars for trafficking in ivory. Right? It did not matter whether you had an ivory uh, necklace or you had a truckload of two tons of ivory. Now, the price of ivory trafficking or the cost of the penalty is life imprisonment. So we've come a long way um, as a country from 2010. Um, now, I want to spend the next few minutes 
telling you a little bit about elephants. Millions of people spend millions of dollars to come to Africa to see our wildlife. I grew up with elephants, and I remember the first time I saw an elephant, I, was, I grew up in the foothills of Mount Kenya, and it was 6 a.m. in the morning. I think I was about six years old. I walked out of my grandmother's house, and across the ridge were a herd of about 20, 30 elephants. Now, I had never seen an elephant in my life before then. And we grew up with folktales about giants and whatnot. So I ran back to the house and screamed to my grand grandmother, Giants, giants are coming. There are giants outside the house. Come help us. And you know, she said, Giants? So she, she goes out of the house and looks across the ridge. And she says, Yeah, no, those are not giants. Those are elephants. You know? <laughs> now, scientists postulate that elephants will go extinct in our lifetime if the status quo remains unchanged. What that means is that millions of children will not have the excitement that I had when I was six years old. It means that a tourist or a person who spends their entire lifetime saving to afford vacation in Africa will not have to do that anymore because there, there will be no elephants to see at all. Now, we fail to recognize just how special these elephants are. Now, for instance, this huge bull uh, before you is about, stands about four meters high to the shoulder and weighs about six to eight tons. They have the biggest ears amongst all animals and their ears measure about two meters across. What that means is that they can hear incredibly well. If we all pretend that we are a herd of elephants in Amboseli National Park in Kenya attending the Foreman Biodiversity Lecture there, a herd of elephants about six to nine miles away would be able to hear us. They would know exactly what we are saying. They would know exactly who is speaking. They would know what language he or she is speaking. And the most fantastic thing, they'd be able to communicate to us. That's how they get boyfriends and girlfriends. <laughs> anyway, um, now more research has been done in Kenya on elephants than any other place in the world. This research is run by Cynthia Moss in Amboseli National Park. It has spanned over half a decade. The family you see before you, the elephant uh, at the forefront, that's Ella in the EB family. So we know each and every elephant in Amboseli National Park by name. We know their sister, their brother, their cousin, their aunties. We can draw a family tree of all of these elephants. Now, these elephants live a very social life similar to ours. Elephant families are led by matriarchs, and they're very emotional. They are the only animals close to humans who mourn their dead. The most touching scene I have ever seen is of an elephant in Amboseli National Park that was walking and came across bones of a dead relative. And it curled its trunk around the bones, and a tear fell from its eyes. That is just how social and emotional these animals are. I'd like to introduce you to the QB family in Amboseli. So this beautiful big matriarch there is called Kintilla. Sorry, Kamkat. Kamkat is a 44-year-old matriarch. You can see her right there uh, with Kwaye, her grandson, Q-tip, and her daughter, Kwanzo, who's next to Kwaye. Now, Comfort learned how to lead her family from the matriarchs before her. She will teach her daughters how to lead future families. Comfort will pass on this knowledge 
from her generation to the next and that generation to the next. That is how elephant societies develop. In October 2012, Kamkat and her family were gunned down by poachers in Amboseli National Park. That entire family slaughtered in cold blood. The only person to survive was two-week-old Kwanza. She was found traumatized, crying next to the mutilated body of one of her aunties. Now the suspected killers of Comcot and her family were arrested, they were charged in court, they were granted bail, and they jumped bail. They flew into Tanzania, they killed another elephant family, they were arrested, they were charged, they applied for bail, they were granted bail, they jumped bail. And until today, they're on the loose. Now, this situation is not unique to Kenya. This is happening in Tanzania, this is happening in Uganda, an even worse scenario happened in Cameroon, where a bunch of dozen men marched into the country as one of the country's national parks, heavily armed with military issue ammunition and slaughtered 600 elephants. Now, our legal system as a country and as a continent has allowed murderers like this to get away with it, to be brazen and to be successful in not only slaughtering entire herds of elephant families, but threatening the livelihoods of communities who offer voluntarily their land for conservation. They threaten Kenya's economy by threatening the security of tourists who spend millions of dollars in their life savings to come to Kenya and other African countries to see these beautiful animals. But most importantly, they rob our children and our children's children a future. That right there is the First Lady of the Republic of Kenya, Her Excellency Margaret Kenyatta. She is the patron of Hands Off Our Elephants campaign. Now this, how would any one of you describe this photo? Just shout out an adjective for that photo. Somebody. Cute? Joyful. Now this photo is nothing but that. That calf is receiving milk from Her Excellency because her mother is dead. She cannot suckle from her mother's breast because she was gunned down by poachers. Now it's not only matriarchs who are afflicted by this. This right there is Leruka. He's, uh, he was a bull uh, in Masai Mara, and right there you can see a KWS ranger next to him. Was shot and injured. KWS fought. KWS is the Kenya Wildlife Service. They fought valiantly to save his life, but they, they couldn't. That is a towel. Before his death, he was arguably the biggest elephant in the world. His home was the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. He would walk over from Tanzania to Kenya and back again. Tourists would fly in for the Satao migration, just to come and see Satao. We lost him to poachers. Now let us talk a little bit about the scourge we're facing. This is a strong room in Tanzania. Illegal trade in ivory 
is robbing Kenya and other African countries billions of US dollars worth of revenue. Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda together account for 80% of the ivory flows across Africa into Asia. Tanzania has lost 60% of its elephant population over the past decade. Behind me is one of Kenya's strong rooms of ivory. Now, Kenya's stockpile is over 100 tons of ivory. We are proud that our president has made the decision to ban each and every single task in, those, in that stockpile. And this will happen on the 30th of April this, this year. And it's a gesture. It's a gesture to communicate to the world that elephants are worth more alive than dead. Ivory is coveted in Asia as a fashion item that wealthy people, you know, have to show off that they are wealthy. Like a Rolex or a Mercedes Benz or a pair of diamond earrings. Now, the one-off sale to China in 2009 triggered the massive demand that we are currently, that has currently put us in this, in this position. Statistics show that 200 million Chinese people entered the middle income range, and 84% of those want to own ivory. When we asked Chinese people in China where they think ivory comes from, they thought that the same way a dog sheds hair or your tooth falls out, that's how elephants shed ivory, and that they offer it up for beauty and to be enjoyed by human beings. This is the sort of ignorance that we have to fight. Now, the Gao Clark study uh, showed that Chinese buyers of Tanzanian elephant tusks paid between 250 US dollars to 300 US dollars per kilo. Now, after being smuggled to China, that price goes up to 2,700 US dollars per kilo. It is this escalating price that makes poaching and trafficking of ivory profitable because very few other commodities have such huge profit margins. Now, as a country, we are fixing the mess in Kenya. We are changing our laws and we have managed to change our law. As I said earlier, the price of ivory is now life imprisonment. But that is if you're caught in Kenya and prosecuted in Kenya. What happens if the same, if you're caught in Thailand and prosecuted in Thailand, or Vietnam, or Tanzania, or Uganda, or Botswana? Or South Africa. It is these discrepancies in how we view wildlife crime, some countries taking it seriously, and some countries taking it lightly. That's an impediment to successfully fighting wildlife crime. Now this route shows exactly how ever is moving from Africa to China. And from that, you can see that East Africa is the conduit out of Africa. And it's not out of Africa to any other areas, but really to the Far East. So we need as a continent and as the world, to merge our efforts, transit countries, demand countries, and source countries, to work together to ensure that we do not have that um, 
situation in the next 5, 10, 20, 50 years to come. So what can we as lawyers, as advocates, who are passionate and committed to seeing the end of this slaughter do? Let's all imagine two inverted martini glasses. I know I've said the word martini. Let's not go to the after party. Let's just concentrate on this. At the far end, the broader side of the glass, you have the cheap, replaceable elements. That's the poachers who are paid $100 to kill an elephant across Africa, and that's the people who sell ivory trinkets, processed ivory trinkets in Vietnam, Thailand, Asia, whatever. Now, as you come closer to the middle, the number of people diminishes, right? And these are the middlemen. These are the people with the money to move ivory across continents. And that is where we should focus our efforts. Because everybody else in that chain is replaceable, and it does not cost much to replace a Maasai poacher. But it costs a lot more, and it will take a lot more to replace a trusted ally and middleman and kingpin at Mombasa port who promises to clear 20 tons of ivory per month for a businessman in China. Those are the people we need to go for. So how do we go after them? The single most important decision as a prosecutor, as simple as it sounds, is making the decision to charge is making the decision to prosecute. Failure and hesitation to try difficult, complex, wildlife crime cases that transverse continents is the one thing that we're fighting against. It's the one thing that's keeping us away. The failure of a prosecutor in Uganda, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Thailand to work together to take these people to court because that communicates to the cartels that we don't have the resources, we don't have the willpower, and we don't have the political will to go after them. Secondly, this failure and hesitation to prosecute ensures that as a country and as a continent, we do not have environmental and wildlife crime jurisprudence. There is nothing for the courts to go on. There is, we don't have bold prosecutors who will push the envelope and create stalling jurisprudence in which, which you know, generations that will come after us will use and that will protect elephants for eternity, as it were. More often than not, wildlife crime is a strict liability crime. It does not matter if the, if the charge is possession of ivory. It doesn't matter whether you knew you possessed the ivory. It doesn't matter why you were in possession of the ivory. But in my experience monitoring wildlife crime in Kenya, a court is hesitant to give life imprisonment as a penalty to an elderly Chinese lady who's transiting through Nairobi at Jomo Kenyatta International for wearing a pair of ivory earrings. If I were the magistrate sitting on in that case, I would give her a suspended sentence and allow her on her way to go. Now, the prosecutor in that case, due to public interest, is not willing to appeal such a sentence. And what does this mean? It means that we as prosecutors and as advocates who are fighting for justice for wildlife have to ensure that our laws are in touch and practical. That exact situation is what we are grappling with as a country back in Kenya. Because as NGOs and as the conservation industry, we pushed for stricter penalties, but then we were left with 
a law that does not allow for judicial discretion. Thirdly, prosecutor-led investigations ensures that all intelligence in wildlife crime leads to forward tracking to find out where the ivory and to whom the ivory was being tra trafficked to or transiting to, and backtracking to find out who sent the ivory from whether Cameroon, Congo, Tanzania to Mombasa port. Now, the hesitation of prosecutors to get involved in investigations has led to that problem, that prosecutors and lawyers will, wear, will puff up their chest and say, I spent six years, seven years, eight years learning the law. It's not my job to do your investigations for you. Give me an investigations file. But you're the people who will know what sort of evidence will hold up in court whether evidence gotten by entrapment will hold up in court. You're the people who would be in a position to advise investigators. So the duty is to not puff up our chest. Yes, we spent a lot of man hours in law school, but to actually sit with investigators and get down that level and say, Let's investigate this together and let me guide you on what to look for, how to get the evidence so that we can have a watertight case. Thirdly, lawyers are, that's fourthly, lawyers are taught to respect jurisdictional boundaries, right? Most countries in the world have reciprocal uh, laws and regulations on how foreign attorneys can practice in our courts. Now, I'm aware from a conversation with Professor Gardner yesterday that Florida is not exactly the epitome of reciprocity. <laughs> However, it's the only way, in my view, to handle the transnational nature of this crime, to prosecute organized wildlife crime through allowing prosecutors from neighboring countries, from transit countries, to sit in as core counsel or to have a mega prosecution of a case. Yes, it will involve a lot of multilateral um, legal agreements, but that's why we went to law school, to be good negotiators and drafters of these agreements and to change the world while we're doing it. Number five. We need to do away with the myth of the specialized criminal. There is no such thing as a specialized criminal. You will not find on your hands a drug dealer who is presented with an opportunity to make a thousand percent profit transiting in ivory telling you, ah, no, I only do narcotics, I don't do ivory, thank you very much. No, he will jump at the chance. And the problem is, as lawyers, we keep looking at laws and, at, and as, at criminals from a very structured and restrictive perspective. What are we getting him for? Is it money laundering? Is it wildlife crime? And when you're told he's trafficking in ivory, he was shipping out a container from Kenya of two tons of ivory, then we say, okay, let's go to the Wildlife Act. But we can use ancillary legislation, right? And we can use anti-money laundering law. We can use organized crime law. Do we all recognize the person on our screen? Yes, no? That's Al Capone. He is known for being a leading criminal in one drugs, two, prostitution, three, a lot of other things. But what eventually got him was tax evasion law, right? Did that solve the problem? Did it get him off the streets? Yes. It's not really, in this particular case, the end justified the means. And that is how we need to look at transnational wildlife crime perpetrators. 
Now, I would like us to think about these things from a global perspective. Not to think as prosecutors in India, not to think as prosecutors in South Korea, not to think as prosecutors in Kenya, but to think as global prosecutors. Because what you do in your country solves the problem in another country and ensures that the burden of ensuring that elephants roam free in the world for hundreds, thousands of years to come has been fulfilled. Now, as I conclude, I would like to say this. The duty to ensure that the world's critical and critically endangered species endure forever is the duty of every global citizen. But an even greater duty lies on your shoulders as attorneys, and that is the duty to ensure justice for wildlife. Because yes, we may have elephants, but if they're distressed elephants, we have not fulfilled our goal. So may your gifts, may your thoughts, and may the work of your hands ensure that what happened to Satao will never happen again. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, um, thank you very much for such a great presentation. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Kenya increased the penalty for wildlife crime from $400 to life imprisonment. Um, do you have any statistics on how many cases actually uh, went like that? Okay, so current statistics, uh, statistics sorry, show a 78% conviction rate. That's for 2014 to 2015. However, uh, as I mentioned, courts are very hesitant to give the life imprisonment uh, penalty. So what they're doing is that they're giving the option of the fine, which is 200,000 US dollars. But we're not getting there yet. They're giving less uh, of, than 20,000 US dollars. And that gives us about 6% of people going to jail and getting direct jail sentences from seven years in jail to about 20 years in jail. Hi. Um, I was just wondering how receptive the prosecution community has been. Have they, are they happy with the changes? Is it something that they think will help their work? Or have you experienced some resistance? What do you think are the, the challenges there? The conservation community? No, the prosecution okay. community. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we, we, have, we have a very good... Uh, relationship with the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. That is where the 35 specialized wildlife crime prosecutors are seated. And we have been offering constant training and support to us and, and prosecutorial support even with cases, watching brief in certain cases, which means sitting with the prosecutors in court and, and offering that sort of uh, background. So we, we have um, seen a very improved and concerted effort to actually go beyond and push the envelope, as I was saying, and use ancillary legislation. For instance, for the first time in the history of Kenya, we have two cases pending in court where suspected wildlife uh, traffickers were trying to move cumulatively about eight tons of ivory from Mombasa port are facing uh, money laundering charges, organized crime charges, as well as customs uh, charges under the clause for you know, exporting contraband and illegal uh, goods. So we, we have seen a very improved uh, sort of scenario with that office and we're happy with what they're doing. Yeah. Thanks for your session. I am, I, it's, um, the question is about the way of our array of confiscated ivories and its disposal. I'm afraid it may be too straightforward to relate it to its topic of this competition. Anyway, so I wonder that in average, how much amount of the ivory is confiscated for the investigation? And the second one is that, what is, um, in your affairs, what is the most preferable way for the disposal, which is confiscated, uh, the confiscated ivory, from your perspective? Thank you. Um, well, 
Kenya is burning all um, its ivory stockpiles. We believe that uh, burning is the best way to go about it. Number one, because crushing, you still have a pile of ivory left to handle. Um, I think to your first question, um, we, in, in court currently, every single uh, case that's pending, ivory related, um, all that ivory is forfeited to the state. And, any, and in addition to that, any property, private property that has been used to commit that offense is also for, forfeited to the state for, for sale or destruction or whatever. For instance, if you're charged with trafficking ivory and it was found in your kayak or in your house, then the house is forfeited to the state. What this ensures is that you, we go after the capital that these perpetrators have to actually buy the ivory. And we, in fact, one of the cases pending in court right now, we've actually gotten uh, freezing orders and we've frozen their accounts and, and seized their property to ensure that they do not perpetrate these crimes in future. Has that answered your question? Um, good evening. Thank you very much for spending your time with us. Um, I'd like to ask about whether you think that the interests of conservation can ever coexist with any kind of legal ivory market. Because there are arguments on one side that the, the cultural skills that go into shaping ivory, scrimshaw and so on, are also important to preserve. So do you think there could ever be a market for ethical ivory? Or is a total ban the solution? Thank you. Okay. So there are good cultural practices and bad cultural practices. A good example, and I'd like to answer questions using analogy, is the cultural practice in Kenya, and especially in northern Kenya, of female genital mutilation. When we passed the law to criminalize female genital mutilation, that argument came up, that it's a cultural practice, they've done it for hundreds of years, blah, blah, blah. But if your cultural practice infringes on the rights of other citizens and of other countries, then definitely we have to do away with it. So in my opinion, no. There's, there's not a way that we can have a proper legal market for everyone. Hi. <clears throat> yes, um, I have a question about uh, whether you have um, official alliances in Thailand for, you know, uh, prosecuting across borders, investigating across borders. What, what pattern has been established there? What, what's going on with that? Okay. Is that all? Um, yeah, potentially, I'm, I'm wondering if um, there, if, if you, uh, short version is I'm a retired lawyer from Minnesota. I go to Thailand every year doing elephant sanctuary work, but it's mostly with a shovel. And I would also like to do it, you know, uh, on a more professional level. And um, th wondering if you can envision some kind of work that retired lawyers, investigators, animal rights people um, might contribute, uh, you know, to this effort in terms of education, in terms of investigation, and, uh, you know, just doing whatever um, tedious work is out there that needs to be done because we have, you know, a lot to do, but we have all day to do it. So. Um, my connection is with the Thai people, and the daughter of the former prime minister is all about elephant and other animal compassion work. And I'm wondering if you already have a relationship there, or if we might work on creating one. Um, so currently, we have two pending cases in court where um, Ivory was seized in Thailand that originated from Kenya and the connections that we currently have as a country is uh, the negotiated multilateral um, legal agreements. Essentially to have Thailand send over DNA samples for us to match them with ivory that was then found in the suspects' houses. But on a broader scale in terms of NGO collaboration, uh, we, our uh, organization, Wildlife Direct, has a but that's in China, a Chinese liaison officer who you know, spent about 10 years in China and is a cultural ambassador and helps us to understand the background of this issue. So uh, in terms of a, con a direct connection with Thailand, no, we do not have one. And I think to your second question, 
one of the things that we are struggling with as a country and as a continent is that we are just playing catch up to the criminals currently. Uh, when you look, for instance, at the situation in Cameroon, the ammunition that they used was a lot more advanced than what the wildlife authority used. They, you know, there's a situation also in Amboseli National Park where a herd of five elephants last year was found dead with bullet wounds to their head. And what that means, given the size of an elephant, is that they were gunned down using a, po a chopper, right? So when you have criminals getting into a national park or a wildlife protected area using a chopper, then you, know, you have a huge problem on your hands. And where retired investigators and, and prosecutors and other professionals can lend a hand is with the training and the capacity building. Uh, one of the things that we've encountered, if you cannot tell, I'm young. So when I get a, a group of judges or magistrates to a room to talk to them about wildlife crime, one of the questions in their minds is, yeah, young girl, what can you tell us, right? Uh, so we, but we have spent uh, a lot of time creating those partnerships and what we are looking for now is for a broader team to help with the mentoring of the investigators and the mentoring of the prosecutors and not just one-off workshop, uh, workshop events where they sit down and they look at a, at a PowerPoint presentation, but actually sitting down with the investigators, working through the case with them and the prosecutors and that sort of thing. So that is where um, your volunteer work could come in handy. Thank you. Other, other uh, questions or comments? And one of, one of the things that, you know, that makes a good conference is if you have an exchange of information and you learn something new. But what really makes a great conference is if you make, the, if you make connections for, for possible collaborations in, in the future. So I hope that we can we could follow up with this with some, some side discussions. Yes. Hey, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. It was really enlightening. And I'd like to make a question, because uh, back in Brazil, um, maybe it's not as blatant like in, uh, with the ivory, but we have like groups of uh, strong farmers that are constantly pressuring against the forest code and changes. Do you have that sort of group in Kenya that's trying to uh, set back the evolutions? Set back what? Say the last the, the, the evolutions that you've made trying to protect and stop the, the ivory uh, poaching. <laughs> um, the problem we have is actually with communities surrounding national parks. Now, until the new Wildlife Act came into force in January of 2014, conservancies and community participation in wildlife conservation operated in a vacuum of law. The law did not recognize that a private citizen can hmm? participate in wildlife conservation. What this meant is that we had to come up with uh, new structures and models to offer them, to offer conservancy, I mean, uh, communities uh, that live adjacent to national parks or in wildlife dispersal areas uh, an opportunity to do that. Now, the Wildlife Act has an interesting um, provision for compensation in human wildlife conflict. Now, to put it in layman's terms, if you kill an elephant, you pay 200,000 US dollars. If an elephant kills you, the government pays you a maximum of 50,000 US dollars. Now, these are the questions we have to battle with, especially when we prosecute poachers from those communities. Because once it is known, and the courts are you know, proximate to wildlife uh, conservation areas, most of them that are in, in, in uh, those areas, and one of the questions we have to answer as the conservation community is, why do you care more about elephants than humans? But that's, not, that's, that's clearly not, not the point. So with that, um, sort of, I, I'm hesitant to call it opposition from communities, but that's the thing that we're struggling with, exactly, exactly. And we are doing a lot of, a lot of um, 
public education and outreach for these communities. And we realized that one of the things that they did not understand was the Wildlife Conservation and Management Act. So what we did is we, we rolled out an outreach and education um, program specifically for the Wildlife Conservation and Management Act and we got them a little booklet that really just explained, number one, all the wonderful new things that, they can do, that the law allows them to do and then uh, the last part of it is you know, contraventions and penalties and of the act and, and really breaking, out, breaking down the language of the law to a language that they can understand has helped us deal with that. All right, let me ask, uh, I'll ask a final question then if there are no other, no other comments or interventions. Um, what, um, if, if, there is a, if there is a law student here uh, who is interested in supporting uh, Wildlife Direct, uh, how can they do that? And, um, and do you have internship uh, options for them? So that is the most fantastic thing about my job at Wildlife Direct, uh, that it allows me to create a generation of wildlife warriors and how Wildlife Direct works, uh, number one, because donors are very hesitant to pay for staff costs, is that we utilize a huge pool of volunteers and, and interns. For instance, we have a current pool of about 400 interns for the organization. Now, the internship, not interns, sorry, volunteers, and how it works is that you send an email to me or to an email that you'll find on our website. Our website is wildlifedirect.org. And um, we will put you on, 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 on the list of uh, internships. You just tell us when you would expect to come to Kenya and how you can do it. Uh, we are also exploring and we have partnerships with a lot of volunteers to do our social media work and to become ambassadors for wildlife. It is not so much coming over to Kenya and working physically in the office, but what you can do as citizens in your own countries to support the cause. Yeah. Elizabeth, thank you so much for uh, a wonderful start to the, uh, to the conference. Please join me in thanking you.